economic growth and innovation. I'm Karen Mulberry. I'm with the Internet Society, and I'm the moderator of this panel today. During the past several decades, the Internet has become a key platform for innovation. It's contributed a lot of economic growth globally, regionally, and locally. And, and through this, and fostering this open Internet and the free flow of information, it has increased the transparency and, and the exchange of, of information between um, collaborative communities, and it's built upon the, the, the premise of openness, the open standards, and the open collaboration, and the open innovation. All of this is very, very important, in particular when you look at the, the OECD um, Council recommendation on the uh, Internet policy-making principles. It has three very key aspects when you look at the 14 principles. It's the promotion of the uh, global free flow of information. It's the preservation of the open, distributed, and interconnected nature of the Internet. And the adoption of a multi-stakeholder approach to developing Internet policies which guarantees transparency and effectiveness. When you look at these three common themes in the OECD principles, what comes out of that are, in essence, four key areas. It would be technology and open standards, and the enablers that open standards create not only today, but for laying platforms for into the future. When you look at the economic and, op and, and what that contributes to open markets. When you look at society, and, and, and the fact that, it, that the openness process contributes to the free flow of communication and information. And finally, when you look at governance and the fact that the collaboration actually encourages us all to get together in a multi-stakeholder dialogue and contribute to the management of the whole. So using that as, a, as our opening, I would like to have our panelists introduce themselves and then provide a few remarks. Thank you, Karen. My name is Chris Buckridge. Um, I'm an external relations officer with the RIPE NCC, which is a regional internet registry for a service region covering Europe, the Middle East, and into Central Asia. Um, it also facilitates the open processes of the RIPE community, which includes policy development um, and the twice yearly RIPE meetings. RIPE NCC is also a founding member of the Internet Technical Advisory Committee to the OECD. Um, and in that capacity, I work as liaison to the CISP working party within the OECD or the ITAC. Openness is central to the work that we do as an RIR. In a technical sense, the Internet is conceived as an open network. And this has been really in a technical sense to its success. <laughs> I sound like that. Um, the, free, the free movement of packets across the network and end-to-end -end connectivity are really very fundamental. And there are a lot of concerns right now for the continuing, um, the continuance of that model. Uh, listening to people from RIRs, you probably hear a lot about the, the need to move to IPv6 and the exhaustion of the IPv4 addresses. A lot of our concerns in that area are driven by the fact that with the exhaustion of IPv4, suddenly we find network operators are restricted in how many those v4 addresses they can use, and that they need to work around this using technology, technology called carrier-grade network address translation, which allows multiple users on the same IP address. What this does is breaks the simple end-to-end -end model, and with that loss comes the risk of risk to the characteristics that make the internet so adaptable and dynamic, characteristics like innovation without permission. The open, openness in that 
te very technical sense, also translates then to the way that the RAR communities work. Um, in the case of RIPE, we make policies regarding the management, allocation, registration of IP addresses. Openness in that, that model is very fundamental because the internet is in a re very real sense built on trust. The routing decisions that network operators make are based on the registrations that RIRs make publicly available in WHOIS databases. And that in turn is vital to ensuring the uniqueness of IP addresses, which is also vi which is vital then to ensuring that when you, actually, you can actually reach the part of the network you want to reach, whether it's a website or an email address. In the case of the RIR communities, this openness is achieved by working on mailing lists through meetings that are open to any interested party. And like everyone else, the last decade has brought changes to the way that works in practice. While the RIP community has always been open to anyone, the reality was, for many years, that it was essentially a community of techies and network operators. While that's still true to a great extent, we've seen increasing interest in what we do from the public sector, from law enforcement, from civil society and academia. And ensuring that our processes are open to those stakeholders, not just technically, but in a way that recognizes the challenge that still exists for full participation has been a, a challenge for us over recent years. I've spoken largely from my own experience with RIRs here, um, but many of the same arguments hold true for organizations like the IETF, the IEEE, where trust in the process of developing standards in an open way is vital to reaching consensus on the best solutions to whatever technical challenge arises. As the internet grows, it's also vital to ensuring that those standards don't conflict. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. My name is Jeremy Malcolm. I work for Consumers International, which is the Global Federation of Consumer Groups. Uh, and I also happen to be a member of the steering committee of CSAC, the Civil Society Information Society Advisory Committee to the OECD. And uh, so it was a great pleasure for me to be invited to participate in this workshop um, representing uh, a segment of civil society. Uh, but uh, I was also a little bit uh, confounded by the fact that there was precious little to disagree with about the topic. And I, I really like to take a contrarian position whenever I can. And so um, I'm going to uh, talk about why I hate openness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's an exaggeration, of course. Um, we, we do uh, agree with the substance of the Council recommendation on internet policy making principles, um, and we do agree with open standards, open source, um, uh, open governance. Um, but there are a couple of instances where openness doesn't favour a process that's um, good for consumers. So uh, I'm going to give a couple of examples of that. Um, and from the workso workshop description, there was a passage that uh, um, struck me. And that was that any unnecessary restrictions, such as trade barriers, can inhibit growth. And I think openness um, does not equate to no restrictions. Um, we don't think that growth at any costs benefits consumers. Um, there are some limits on openness that are appropriate to protect other values. And one of those values, of course, that's very current at the moment is privacy. So um, a couple of um, areas in which um, a, a more um, closed process or a more closed um, procedure can protect privacy is in relation to online tracking and the free flow of information. So I'm going to deal with those two separately. They're both about privacy in some sense, but online tracking is a narrower one about uh, tracking um, people online using the web and generally is in relation to uh, commercial tracking. And the broader one, free flow of information, is more of a policy that we're finding in trade law um, about making sure there are no barriers to the flow of information across borders, including um, for commercial or indeed for other purposes. So first, online tracking. Um, uh, this has been a concern for both um, on both sides of the Atlantic. Of course, the European Commission and the Federal Trade Commission both uh, decided that they wanted to do something about um, online behavioural advertising and to give consumers a choice about whether they were tracked online. 
but rather than regulating, um, they decided to delegate this to the World Wide Web Consortium, which was seen as having an open multi-stakeholder process that could deal with this problem. Uh, unfortunately, they were wrong. The W3 process, W3C process was open, um, and yet it has still been described as a colossal failure. And those are not my words, those are actually the words of the Digital Advertising Alliance, um, an industry group. But, uh, but civil society privacy advocates uh, are of the same view that this process has completely failed. So why is that? If it's an open process, surely um, that's the way governance should work. Well, actually, not in all cases. Um, there are cases when a purely open process can actually be very open to industry capture. And that's uh, where we lay the blame for the failure of um, this uh, issue at the W3C. Um, in our view, there are cases where business interests are directly impacted, such as in the case of online behavioural advertising, where you need to have a firmer regulatory hand before you can nut out the details in an open standards development process. So what we think should have happened is that the Commission and the FTC should have given much stronger, clearer policy guidance to the W3C and basically told it what standard it should be developing rather than leaving it open for a working group that could be captured by industry and would ultimately fall down and fail. Because as a result of leaving it open, um, it, the ball is now back in the regulator's court and it's back for them to do something um, rather than uh, and we've lost two years in the process. So that's one case in which a closed model can be a little better, or at least a more structured model of multi-stakeholder participation. And in fact, the OECD model is a little better. Um, we have the Information, Computer and Communication Committee, the ICCP, um, which is an intergovernmental group, and then we have three quite structured advisory councils, including CSAC, the civil society, the technical community and business, all have um, their roles to play. And, and that structured sort of process can actually be more effective than a completely open process like the IETF, um, where it's an open door, but there's actually no structure within that. Um, so that's the first thought I want to, to give on how a more closed or a more structured process can be better than a completely open process in certain policy areas where there are contested issues and commercial interests at stake. The second example of when we don't support openness uh, uh, in its purest form is in relation to the free flow of information across borders. And this um, is uh, a, a trade policy um, that goes back to the, um, the GATS, which says in Article 14 um, that nothing prevents a country from implementing measures for the protection of the privacy of individuals in relation to the processing and dissemination of personal data and the protection of confidentiality of individual records and accounts. So this is the kind of uh, provision that allows countries to limit the flow of information across borders. When we go to the OECD, we find it slightly narrower. So the OECD guidelines on the protection of privacy and transporter flows of personal data um, sort of turns that wording on its head and says, Members country, member countries should avoid developing laws, policies and practices in the name of the protection of privacy and individual liberties, which would create obstacles to transporter flows of personal data that would exceed requirements for such protection. So it's not actually saying something different um, to the GATS, but it's emphasising it quite differently and saying don't develop privacy laws um, if they go beyond what they really need to. So this is a shift of emphasis that um, I would question, um, given that privacy is actually a fundamental human right and perhaps should come uh, at the top of the consideration of uh, transporter flows of personal data. Um, uh, it's recognised, of course, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Council of Europe Convention 108 and, and, and other instruments. Um, so currently, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is under negotiation and they're hoping to wrap it up this year. The Trans-Pacific Partnership contains new text on the transporter flow of personal data. 
and um, there is a push from industry to make it uh, even stricter um, than either under GATS or under the OECD principles. Um, the current text in bilateral trade agreements on free flow of information um, says something like recognizing the, this is from the Korean US FTA, it says recognizing the importance of free flow of information in facilitating trade, the parties shall endeavor to refrain from imposing or maintaining unnecessary barriers to electronic information, flow, information flows across borders. But there's pressure from industry to, um, uh, to uh, even narrow the scope of restrictions on information flows. For example, by removing the text across borders so that even information flows within a country should not have um, restrictions to protect personal privacy at the expense of information flow. So this is a real tension. Uh, we want to make sure that in instruments like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the flow of information across borders is not given a higher priority than the fundamental human right um, to privacy and confidentiality of personal information. And so this is the second example that I want to give of where openness um, is not actually the highest value for consumers. In, in such cases, um, there are higher values that we think should prevail. So in summary, uh, we do support openness. However, uh, we don't support it blindly. There are areas in which openness is uh, just one interest that has to be balanced against other very important interests to consumers. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Hussain Badran. Um, I represent uh, here um, civil society, point of view of being a member of ISOC Egypt chapter and on the board, uh, but presenting slightly in, in general. First, let's thank the kind invitation to be part of the panel. Uh, it's, it's a great topic and it's great to be, to be in Bali for, for the first time. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm a member of ISOC, um, um, uh, Ch Egypt chapter of, 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 uh, board of directors. I'm also a member of the board of um, uh, National Telecommunication Institute of, uh, of Egypt, which is part of the Ministry of Communication, and the um, board of trustees of the Information Technology Institute, also part of the Ministry of uh, uh, Telecommunication and Information Technology. I'm also part of the e-commerce um, national committee which sees how to address obstacles uh, in Egypt that uh, hinder e-commerce uh, adoption at a larger scale than is uh, right now and what can be done in different sectors of, um, of the economy, government and private sector uh, um, and other entities to overcome these, uh, these issues. So I'll be addressing in, in today in this um, very critical topic issues of um, two, two aspects. <clears throat> One in terms of uh, citizen participation and um, in, in policy making and decision making, um, as also the multi-stakeholder multi model, uh, and then at the end the, on the issue of uh, business uh, creation and the experience with the e-commerce uh, committee so, uh, so far. Of course, reflecting the what's happening um, in the, these times in, in Egypt and in the Arab countries and region, particularly um, in the presence or following the Arab Spring, which is still, still unfolding. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the issue of uh, citizen participation and um, uh, in, in activities and trying to influence uh, policy and the public opinion and the way policies are being made, we see actually <clears throat> uh, we have seen uh, an evolution of, uh, of openness over the last uh, two years, particularly in countries like uh, Egypt, where people's opinion is being heard and they can influence directly to a larger extent uh, how policies are being uh, can be adopted. Unfortunately, in light of the, of the military coup that happened on the 30th, uh, 3rd of, uh, of July, this was reversed back 180 degrees, and we see now, again, a crackdown on um, uh, online participation, as well as, of course, offline uh, activism. We see this um, uh, um, in Egypt, but also in different countries across the region. We see limiting access to, to websites, um, putting obstacles in terms of um, 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 uh, creating uh, websites that have news, news information, update news information, and different points of view than, than being, than being um, circulated by government agencies, um, making the licensing process really, really quite difficult to, to adopt, as well as blocking, blocking internet services such as WhatsApp and Viper and Tango in different countries and citing the main um, reason to be issues of national security, which is a very broad 
broad uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, also, we see uh, uh, um, the issue of uh, um, following uh, online bloggers as well as online jour uh, journalism, uh, journals um, and uh, prosecuting them in, in, in courts, in, in some countries actually in military courts. So we see this kind of, of, of development that is the anti-openness anti, uh, and anti-participation uh, um, uh, in the decision-making for, uh, for citizens and, and society. And as I mentioned, it is, reflects online what's happening actually uh, offline in the, in the real world. Um, uh, we see this um, reflected in um, opinions of uh, activists. We had, I'm part of the MAG, for the Arab IGF, and we had a session, our second Arab IGF, um, in Algeria two weeks ago. And in the session, openness and content, these issues were quite obviously highlighted from different current, uh, countries in the Arab region. So there is a plea to, to Arab governments to try to um, uh, promote openness and not use issues of security and national, uh, national security as um, just a reason to, to block access and to block content creation and to block citizen participation. Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, business, business creation, um, the uh, issue of uh, e-commerce e is, being, is being seen as an opportunity actually to uh, propel the, the economy in different countries in the region particularly because we have a young, young, young population. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, not for, I mean, some cases, the young population wants to use, to be active on, online. They are active on social media. So get, getting the, the, extra, <clears throat> I mean, the extra mile, trying to do commerce and, and, and uh, financial transactions online um, is certainly an, uh, a possibility. Um, we see internet penetration um, uh, an acceptable level, but broadband penetration is quite low in the single digits in most, in most Arab countries. Some countries are investing high in infrastructure development that promotes uh, fiber to the home and uh, other, other medias of, of broadband access. M mobile access uh, and mobile data is one of the highest areas of growth is, is the Middle East and emerging markets. Um, but there are obstacles for, for e-commerce uh, to, to flourish uh, in the medium to, uh, to sh uh, short, short to medium term. We see some challenges, particularly from the work of the national committee that I participate in, is uh, issues of payment, particularly lack of, of credit cards, uh, credit cards in general, and credit cards that have online access um, uh, allowed. Uh, in, in particular, we see in Egypt a population of 90 million, less than 10 million credit cards have been issued. Maybe uh, only a quarter of them has online access possibility. Um, we see issues of uh, cost of host hosting, uh, who hosting in country, uh, provides service providers have hosting capability, but the pricing is still quite, quite high. Um, also, we see tax issues uh, because we, um, taxes have to be paid on services rendered, being offline or online. Consumer is not yet familiar with the issue of, of paying taxes, uh, particularly for on online services. So that this has to be ha has to be addressed with um, awareness and, and uh, consumer awareness and get familiar with doing transactions online to, to, to begin with. Uh, so the culture of doing transactions online need, needs to be needs to be enhanced through um, a different types of awareness awareness uh, campaigns. And then the ecosystem for, for e-commerce also needs, needs to be um, strengthened. Uh, issues of payment, um, um, web, website creation, is, is be, of course, is, is there, but um, on a larger scale, because talk about 90 million uh, uh, people in Egypt alone, um, uh, payment <clears throat> at when the service is rendered, when the goods are delivered, can be, can, can, can be also done. But companies do this have, have to be created, created, and this is still, uh, still an obstacle. So uh, the, the, uh, the point here is that um, there is a very strong potential for SMEs, small and medium businesses, for consumers to, to be um, on, the, on the wagon of, of e-commerce and, and online um, uh, trading, uh, non online transactions, provided that government put the right legislation in place as well uh, and have promote people's faith and, and trust in, in online, uh, online activities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Aladef. Um, I, too, participate in the OECD through BIAC, which is the business voice in the OECD. We, we left one constituency out. There's also TUAC, which is the trade union voice that is also an observer uh, in, in the OECD ICCP. Um, 
Uh, apart from BIAC, I, am, I also chair the Digital Economy Commission at the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, which through BASIS helps coordinate IGF participation for business. Um, and then uh, in my day job, I seem to work for Oracle. Um, the um, uh, open is, is a very important concept and uh, has a lot of meanings for a lot of different people. Uh, in, in, a, in a way, the concept uh, reads a little bit like modern art in the sense that you bring to the painting something to help interpret it. Um, you know, whether it's a woman sitting on a chair or an apple sitting on a table, it's up to the viewer to decide wh what, what the painting really imports. But one of the things I think that, w that we see with open is open and association to a multi-stakeholder process is an important concept and linkage. Uh, and they go very well together. And, and I'm going to use a couple of the examples that have been raised uh, about this uh, because there is, when you take a look at all of the major documents that deal with privacy, they deal with the combination of two concepts, the importance of the free flow of information and the importance of appropriately protecting individual rights and making sure that trust and security are, are elements. Um, and too often we consider that a balancing act when we should be considering that mutual optimization because this could be the new math where one plus one equals three, where you get the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And as we look to these issues, that's where the multi-stakeholder dialogue comes in to be beneficial because often when you're anchored into a text, everyone is also bringing into a text a reading of it that has baggage. When we look at the issues of privacy, when we look at the issues of open, when we look at the way governments do policy making, we end up looking at, from a business perspective, what is the level and the detail of the policy making? Because policy making and regulation that goes to the what, that discusses frameworks related to it and provides guidance to it, is actually useful because that helps embody legal certainty. But when you get to the how, you start to create micromanaging of processes that then can serve to stymie innovation and serve to actually limit the applicability of those rules in various contexts. So one of the things we see is what is the appropriate level of drafting. A number of the OECD instruments are actually wonderful because they stand the test of time because their level of drafting uh, is at a level that people can apply differently over time so there's an adaptability built into them. Now obviously if you're drafting a regulation you have to be more specific than that but when we look at some of the implementations of data protection regulation, for instance, we get to data protection regulators specifying an eight-digit alphanumeric passcode. That is not a useful specification. That gets to be an interference with actually the way you develop and design technology. So part of this openness, part of the ability to use all the resources to make sure they are available to others is making sure we are looking at them at the right level to be appropriate in safeguarding rights while not micromanaging the models and the technology that serve to underpin innovation. And so that becomes one of the parts where the multi-stakeholder dialogue helps create understanding and helps enhance um, the concept of openness. And it's, a, it's an issue that we have in the context of free flows of information. So clearly, information underpins the digital economy and the information society. There, there's no question about that. Some people call it the new oil or the new currency, whatever, whatever term of art you want to use. Um, it is essential. It flows more than ever today. It's likely to flow even more tomorrow. And artificial constructs which try to keep information in one location actually serve to stymie innovation and don't have benefits. That doesn't mean that issues of fundamental rights shouldn't be considered when you talk about data flows. They have to be considered because if you undermine trust in the network, the network is going to lose its value. But we have to figure out how to develop the win-win outcome of those where you're looking to optimize the solutions because I do believe you can have privacy and security. You don't have to choose between one or the other. And part of the way we do this is by preserving the openness 
of the Internet. We preserve the inclusiveness of the Internet. We preserve the multi-stakeholder conversations. And that gets to the point where when you do develop some protective regime related to um, the protection of a fundamental right, it's not a question that you're saying, oh, that regime shouldn't exist. But we all have to recognize that that regime probably has four or five different methods of implementation, many of which may have equal effectiveness, but the effectiveness may come with different levels of burden and different levels of micromanagement of processes. And it is completely legitimate to suggest that if you can find an equally effective way that has less of a burden and less of a disincentive towards innovation, that's the methodology you should choose. In fact, that was one of the concepts that was embedded in the revised explanatory guideline to the OECD privacy guidelines. Uh, if you haven't noticed, they have gone through a revision and a new version of an explanatory, or supplemented version of an explanatory memorandum. And Verena will be happy to give you the, the website linkage to that. Uh, I, I should also recommend, uh, since cloud is one of the major topics that gets discussed in the context of open, the OECD has done some very important work on cloud, uh, including an original background paper they did a couple of years ago, which actually still stands in great stead as a very good basis for how you should think about cloud in the context of policymaking. The last comment I'll make is that um, when we think about the concepts of open and we think about concepts like cloud and, and, and data localization and these other issues, we have to also understand that we have to think at the level of the ecosystem because we have lots of moving parts and you can't just look at this one policy and say how this works. So in APEC there was a document that was called the Digital Prosperity Checklist that essentially looked at a number of different factors uh, that, that governments may think about as they develop policy to help foster innovation and things of that nature. And the concept was that it's a matrix where all of these factors are interconnected. And you can't, if you hold on to one, you affect all of the others. So we have to think of these things in an ecosystem context so that we can figure out how action in one space is acting upon action in another space, which unfortunately means that we all have to become renaissance individuals now because while our current technological society is pushing us towards greater and greater specialization we need to think as generalists as well because you have to consider multiple factors across multiple scenarios to understand the impacts of any action and so um, we, we, we have now a basis upon which we all need to take our minds for a walk and have a stretch um, because too narrow thinking, while it may lead to great expertise, may not actually be what we're looking for. So open is open in the scale of thought uh, and perspective as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hemmerlein. I work for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, uh, NTIA, in the uh, US Department of Commerce. Um, at NTIA, I, I work on a, a broad portfolio of internet governance issues. Uh, I do a lot of work in the multilateral forums, uh, such as the ITU and APEC and other subsidiary bodies of the, uh, the UN. Um, as the lone government representative up here, I take very uh, seriously my responsibility to make the most anodyne and uncontroversial comments this morning, so <laughs> I hope I, I won't disappoint therein. Um, Broadly speaking, openness, of course, is, is very important uh, to the United States government in the way we address uh, Internet policy making. Um, from our perspective, openness means inclusion um, of other parties and stakeholders into our deliberations and transparency uh, into how those decisions uh, are made. Uh, I'm very happy that the, uh, the OECD uh, organized this panel. I was fortunate enough to be uh, detailed to the OECD while the, uh, the policy making principles were being uh, developed. Um, we're very satisfied and we promote uh, whenever possible the, the policy making principles. We think they represent a clear articulation of our position as uh, how the internet uh, policy making should be done. Um, two of them, uh, if we're talking about policy making processes from a government perspective, uh, two are, are quite uh, relevant. Um, if we're reading from top to bottom, number five, which says encourage multi-stakeholder cooperation in policy development processes. Simple enough, but um, 
NTIA, the U.S. government in general, but NTIA specifically, is very respectful of the multi-stakeholder process. Um, we're very aware of the legacy um, from the IETF and other organizations who are so responsible for the growth and success of the Internet. And we certainly try to emulate whenever possible the multi-stakeholder processes that those organizations uh, embody, and we certainly do whatever we can to uh, stay out of their way uh, <laughs> when necessary. Um, and also number eight, which is uh, ensure transparency, fair processes, and accountability. Um, I like these two together in, in a way that they draw a distinction between openness and uh, multi-stakeholder um, approach. Um, they're not always the same thing. So when the pure multi-stakeholder approach is impossible, we certainly like to be transparent and open in the way that our decisions were made to be accountable to our constituents and uh, allow them to influence our processes to the extent possible at any time. Um, these uh, principles are, are reflected in a number of ways that we make decisions uh, in the United States. Um, our congressional processes are, of course, quite open. Our rulemaking processes uh, of the Federal Communication uh, Commission, their, their notice and comment process is, is, of course, very open. And then um, we have an open advocacy and advisory process uh, for U.S. delegations to the ITU and other organizations like that, um, which I think is germane to the discussion that so many of us have had this week on the role of governments uh, in Internet policy making. We certainly think that advocacy for the open Internet and wealth creation is very important in our position, and these organizations are always informed by consultations with uh, U.S. industry, civil society groups, and uh, other interested parties. Um, I'm going to wrap it up right there, but I look forward to a good conversation. Thank you, Thank you very much. And you say that the panelists, and in particular, Chris, you, you mentioned the, the OECD principles. And, and, and the, the, they're a framework for an open and inclusive approach to Internet policy making. Um, I'm not sure how uh, familiar everyone is with the 14 principles. But I thought in terms of providing some context for our discussion on openness and inclusiveness and multi-stakeholder, um, maybe I would provide, um, again, some of the ones that I, too, think are important for our dialogue. And then I will ask the panelists some questions. And hopefully, um, uh, the participants will also have some questions along those lines. I mean, in, in particular, to me, the most important one is, is item number one. And that's promote and protect the global free flow of information. The second one is to promote the open and distributed and interconnected nature of the Internet. Third is promote investment and competition in high-speed networks and services. Fourth is promote and enable the cross-border delivery of services. Fifth is encourage multi-stakeholder cooperation in the policy development processes. Sixth is foster and voluntarily develop codes of conduct. Seventh, develop capacities to bring publicly available, reliable data into the policy-making process. Eight, ensure transparency, fair process, and accountability. Nine, strengthen consistency and effectiveness in privacy protection at a global level. Ten, maximize individual empowerment. Eleven, promote creativity and innovation. 12, limit internet intermediary liability. 13, encourage cooperation to promote internet security. And the last one, give appropriate priority to enforcement efforts. So those are the 14 principles that were adopted in uh, 2011 uh, through the OEDC process. Now, as that relates to what we're talking about in terms of the, the economic value of openness and the contribution to uh, enabling innovation, um, I'd like to ask the panelists some questions. And, and these are questions that um, were, were contributed to this topic through the open consultation that the IGF held prior to the start of the IGF in Bali. Now, the first question, and, and in keeping with, with the OECD principles, is on how does the development of the Internet's open standards contribute to innovation and um, economic growth? So who would like to take that on? Um, 
pardon me. Um, I think innovation without permission, which I mentioned before, is a really fundamental social benefit that the, the internet is, is able to give us and that is facilitated by that openness. I think the second point, you mentioned the um, second principle and promote the open, distributed and in interconnected nature of the internet really speaks to that and is, is about protecting that um, and ensuring that there is, there is that ability there for people, work, stakeholders in, in any group working in any environment who have, that, have, have an internet connection, have access to the internet, are able to innovate, are able to use that end-to-end -end connectivity to develop new ideas, whether that's you know the next Google or Skype or YouTube or whatever it is. Um, I think that's that's a really fundamental social benefit um, in terms of sharing um, the opportunity. So it's not, it's not just something that's restricted to first world or developed economies. It's something that we, when we already see this in a lot of um, the, the development of payment systems and micropayment systems in, in developing countries where people are actually using um, the internet to be able to develop systems that are, benefit them, benefit their communities. Um, I, I don't disagree with any of that, but I do uh, think that there also comes some responsibility uh, in the development of standards and applications um, to make sure that uh, what social impacts they're going to have. Um, and that involves um, um, bringing in other viewpoints maybe besides your own. Um, there are technologies that have caused uh, some problems like uh, think back to the first developer of Netscape who decided to put cookies into the browser. Um, maybe that was a good idea, but it's caused a lot of problems. So maybe it would have been better if they had actually consulted some privacy people before they did that, and it might have saved trouble in the long run. So I think, yes, permissionless innovation, but make sure that that takes place in a context of um, consultation and discussion. And the IGF is a very good place where that can happen. So I, I, I want to go back to the value of open standards for a second, then I want to pick up on, on the comments. And, uh, you know, as a, as a company that, that – so I'll put my day job hat on um, – as a, as a company that, 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 that works in an open standards space, I mean, one of the values of open standards is while we make, make something very large and complex that may not be able to be made by everybody because of the amount of effort it takes to, to put however million lines of code – actually go into one of the major software packages. If they're done in open standards, it allows other people to leverage smaller functional packages that sit off them. So that actually they don't have to, it's not that they have to innovate the same thing, but it allows them to innovate off what's been made. And we see that as a beneficial holistic environment because if people make applications that are useful that sit on top of our, our software, then that makes the software more useful and more accessible to other people. So it's it's an, it's an environment and a win-win situation uh, which is facilitated by open standards. I, I would say when we, when we talk about, and, and I think the, the Internet's a perfect example where when you take you know, some of the new applications in cloud and other things, you actually don't need to have a whole lot of technical knowledge to start beginning to innovate on those because you can actually leverage the technologies that are there. You don't have to reinvent them. And you can actually use you know, the kind of, I put some modules together and now I have a solution and it didn't take a lot of code writing and a lot of technical knowledge to actually create something innovative on top of existing technology. The one thing I, I would caution though, it's not the question of whether you need to think about how cookies are used, but often technology that is designed for one purpose is used for a purpose that isn't foreseen when it's designed. And so I, I just want to caution that I've got no problem in saying we have to look at the use of the technology, but we want to make sure that we're not demonizing the technology itself rather than it can be used for something appropriate or inappropriate. That's a conversation that's been had a lot in the RFID space where if RFID can be evil, well, no, there are uses of RFID that can be problematic, but the technology itself is not the problem. It's how you use it and do you understand the proper context of its use. I guess I just wanted to respond briefly to, to Jeremy's point and also Joseph's point. Um, in terms of the, the Netscape cookies example, not 
just, just to follow on the example you had. I think that that's perhaps an area where there is there are trade-offs, obviously, with open open um, processes, and this is one of those that you, you're going to have elements that emerge that, with hindsight, may not may not have been used the way they were, they were intended, or may just have been a mistake from, from the beginning. I think that's where sort of this fits into a broader paradigm of open processes, because as as you say, the IGF, or there are other other venues as well where okay, this, this system has been developed. We come into an open process where people say, okay, well, hang on, this is, not, this is not something that we want. This is not something productive. So in some ways, openness can be its own self-correcting process. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I believe the, the area of, of uh, issue of open standards is quite, quite important. And from a perspective of developing economies, it allows um, smaller economies or developing economies to participate in the development of applications and tools that address issues of, uh, of nature to these particular geographies or, um, or, or countries. Uh, and, uh, um, an example for exa uh, is the issue of addressing economic problems that can be, done, can be resolved with, with technology adoption. Um, we have issues of um, 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 Putting subsidies to, for, for fuel consumption, for, for food, food imports, and so on. And if you utilize technology like machine, machine communication or sensor based networks um, to, um, to um, optimize consumption of, of, of fuel and, and gas, you can really address issues of, uh, of, of national scale to these, these economies. So if, if, it's, if these applications are built on open standards, then developing countries with their scientists can participate in developing applications and tools that address these specific problems and don't have to rely on tools developed somewhere else and they have to be fine-tuned or recalibrated to work in, in a different environment. Um, at, at, uh, as, an ex as a following point, then we can then participate in putting these open standards together. Once you have the expertise of building your own tools and, building, and enhancing protocols, you can then invent a newer protocol and build an open standard on that as well. So it is a cycle, but it has to start, and I think the starting point is quite, is quite good because you have an economic problem to be addressed. You're spending so much money on addressing it, but the money is not spent on developing a solution or technology or a tool. It's not just spent on importing, importing goods and, uh, and services. Thank you, and, and I think, you know, in this conversation and, and the point, I, I guess that I um, resonated with me with what Jeremy said is, is that in the context of openness, there's also um, a balance that must be struck, and and, there, and and that's truly why it's important to have a multi-stakeholder approach to the conversation to ensure that you can strike that balance, um, that you can create the enablers um, that are of value to developing economies but also need to be aware of um, the potential unintended consequences. So as things evolve, m maybe there's usefulness in, in continuing to revisit where you came from to ensure that you aren't promoting or enabling something that, that shouldn't be continued and used in, in the way that um, it is being used or, in, or even being considered to be used, because then it needs to be readjusted in some fashion. And, and there again, the collaboration of the community would be a value to ensuring that. It, at least, I, I'm hopefully, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this appropriately. Um, any questions from, from the participants? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Manu Sporny. I'm the chair of the Web Payments Group at the World Wide Web Consortium. So um, I'm trying to ground the conversation a bit in um, where the things that the panelists have said um, where basically the, the rubber hits the road, right? Uh, so the, the problem that we're dealing with right now is we're um, building uh, payments into the core architecture of the web. So we, we want to do to payments what email did to personal communication. You should be able to put in somebody's address and send them five cents. It should travel around the world in, in milliseconds. Uh, and having that as a foundational um, first class feature of the web is something that we're trying to accomplish. Now the problem with doing that is that uh, there, there are regulatory issues, there are policy issues, um, and we are effectively a group of technologists. Um, as Jeremy uh, pointed out, uh, the work is primarily, the, the work primarily looks at how do you do it, 
not necessarily what the ramifications are once you do it. Now, we would like to think that we're fairly open-minded and we're thinking holistically about the problem. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the question to the panel is, how do we ensure that we have the right policy framework uh, to develop this technology? The technology is the easy part. It's having conversations with uh, folks like uh, the, the people on the panel. That's the difficult part. So how do we get more policy people into the fold? Um, the other problem, as Jeremy pointed out with the W3C, is that um, a lot of the work continues without policy people involved uh, directly. And the reason that is is because the engineering side of it is afraid that we will get mired down in political, geopolitical debate rather than creating a technology for uh, a very specific use case. So we tend to look at things as, uh, you know, the technology is not evil or good, it's just the technology and we're hoping that it ends up being used in, in the right way. So, so the general question is, we're building this payment mechanism into the core architecture of the web. It's happening right now, and we don't have policy people at the table. How do we get more policy people involved? Um, I think this, this speaks to a sort of wider question that I, I was sort of considering coming before this panel, which is that open processes are actually can sound a little sort of hippie in an easy way out, but actually open processes in, in development are really hard. They, they have a lot of real challenges that they, they present. Um, this has been something, from my experience with RIRs, but also the IETF, where, like you, they're, they're technologists essentially making policy decisions, but really over the last few years have seen a, a much greater interest from the public sector, from policy makers. But while we, while we have open, open processes and open community, anyone can take part, there are challenges to actually allowing people to participate um, from the public sector. The, well, in, in our discussions, there's really a, a very sort of, um, people, people feel very free to say what they want on a mailing list. I think the, the, our policy mailing lists get very rough and tumble. As a government or a government representative, you're not going to necessarily dive in there where you, what you say is going to be taken as representing the government position. So too often what that means is that they won't actually participate, they won't contribute. So while we say everyone is welcome to take a part in this process, the reality is that often a lot of people um, w won't feel able to do that. Speaking just from our own, my, my perspective at the RIPE NCC, we've done a lot of work to try and mitigate that. Um, and that's involved sort of uh, s specific events and forums for government people, um, <laughs> actually, closed meetings where we sort of say, okay, we're an open community, but we will have this meeting where it's an invitation only event for governments and regulators so that you can ask questions, you can say what you want, this is not a, it, whatever you say is not going to be sort of transmitted off to, um, a, as the view of your government on a public mailing list. Um, and the idea is not to have this closed session as part of the policy making process, but to facilitate the incorporation of public sector policymakers into what we're doing with, um, with technical policies. Um, so I think, yeah, some sort of innovation there in, in how those processes actually work is, is um, probably required. So I, I don't know if that's helpful for you. But. Manu, it's a really excellent question. Um, and I think there's an easy answer and a hard answer. Um, the easy answer is you just go ahead and develop it and re don't think about the policy implications because that's <laughs> often what happens. Like think of Bitcoin, think of PGP. They just put the technology out there and then the regulators had to play catch up later. And that may be the answer for you. Um, the hard way of doing it is to do the legwork and find out where is the most appropriate forum or for us for these issues to be discussed around the world. How can I get an appointment to talk with these people? Um, how can I bring them in, create some liaison between our committee and, and their process? Because they're not going to come into your technical committee, obviously. Um, and that is a lot of work. It's expensive. And I know you've told me in a private conversation the W3C doesn't have a lot of money to be throwing around um, to bring in external stakeholders. So, um, yeah, that's the hard answer. And the making it even harder is the fact that I think global payments 
uh, in the way that you're describing are maybe one of these orphan issues that we've been talking about, places that don't have a global forum. There is the OECD, um, but the OECD is, uh, forgive me, I don't know the exact number, 33 countries or something, um, and, and this is really a global question. And, and maybe this is uh, where there is a governance gap out there. So that just makes it even harder still, and I don't have a real answer for you, but um, I think that these are questions that we're all concerned with here at the IGF um, and something that uh, you're not the only one thinking about them. Uh, yes, this is a, certainly an excellent, excellent question, <clears throat> but from my point of view, it, it's a learning process that, um, that we as societies or technologies or academia, as well as government agencies and regulators have to go through uh, together and we shouldn't expect that um, the governments will, will listen from, from, from the first day. The Wicked experience last December was really an excellent experience, and the, and the process of preparation to the Wicked was also an excellent experience. Uh, the certain technology is, is evolving quite rapidly, and um, gov government regulators have an issue on, on getting on board with latest technologies. Uh, um, so it was very really important to try to pre prepare them for what the issues are, what we should be addressed, or could be the, the possible scenarios or positions to take. And that's, as I mentioned, a learning process. Um, but it has to go, it has to be, ha it has to happen. There's no other way around it, it has, has to, to take place. Um, the, one of the challenges that we have seen through this, uh, during this learning process is the government's regard um, the other opinion coming from civil society or academia or the technical, uh, technical side as being a consultancy <coughs> opinion or an advisory opinion. Ultimately, the decision relies with the government entity. So, uh, this, of course, puts, puts a barrier between how the decision can, can be influenced. But if, if trust is built and the trust in, in the soundness of, of the advice given over, over, over time, and, time uh, and, and a period of time, I think the influence of this advice will, will be stronger. As I mentioned, Wicked was a very important step in the learning process, and I, every IGF or every such meeting is, is part of that learning process, and the engagement is very, is very important. Uh, keeping the engagement and with, uh, avoid with technology is, is very critical. In my opinion, there is no other way um, than, than uh, this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement. I think, I mean, the, the concept of understanding social consequences, I think, is a very legitimate concept, and I think you have to have a broad policy discussion, and I think a multi-stakeholder fora is a great place to have that. I think one of the preconditions is, and I think the technologists who participate in the IGF are pretty good at this, but the technologists who are technologists who don't participate in these four aren't so good at this, and that is you have to be able to speak a language someone can actually understand. You know, you can't start with X509 certificates and, you know, because then you've just lost the audience. Um, so one is finding a common language to have the conversation. But I, I want to make sure that we're not losing the concept of you're developing a technology solution that is not actually a simple use case. It's a very complex use case even though it might be a simple solution for a problem. Because it's a complex use case because while you might have different social consequences, you have a lot of legal consequences to what you're doing. So, I mean, I just jotted down a few in the amount of time it took for two other people to make comments and that was authentication and digital signatures. There are, in fact, national and regional requirements related to those. Anti-money laundering is almost every single country and it's not necessarily uniform. Data localization and geographic location issues which are coming more and more to the floor. Uh, data protection, secure personal data and the emanations of that which you might not think of because for instance if you are using an IP address in order to develop a security profile or in order to enhance security you are collecting personally identifiable information that may have consent implications. Encryption, which has regional, local, either standards, prohibitions, or enablements. ID management, cloud standards, analytics, behavior, fraud prevention. So you have an entire legal ecosystem because of the, the, the word payments that you have to live in. And that, you know, multi-stakeholders may help you there, but there is also an obligation to understand the ecosystem you're working in. Uh, just to add real quickly, I, I, I wrote down the question because I wasn't sure I understood. Usually we get questions, how do I get policy people out of our way rather than get them more involved? <laughs> but, um, 
I think uh, Jeremy might have been making a, a joke, but I was going to say originally as well, um, I would not, to the extent possible, not worry about getting policy people or, or government-related people involved in the process. To the extent that you can, you know, build the service or the technology you want, create a good service, create a constituency for it, create a market for it, I think once you build, build that critical mass, then it's, it's more incumbent upon the policy people to react appropriately rather than the other way around, from my perspective. Thank you. I, let me say, I, I, I can tell you from participating in the IETF and the fact that we have, um, for the last you know, close to two years now, been inviting policymakers into the IETF dynamic and how open standards and the debate occurs. And, you know, some points were raised that, that be, became very much aware as we started to do this in, in terms of everyone speaking a different language. And, and we have to uh, come to common ground from both sides so that there is an understanding of, of what a policymaker is looking at when they're trying to develop that structure and framework and, and the requirements they have to, to, you know, to protect their constituency, much like the technologists and the engineers are looking at solving a problem in, in, the, in the best way they possibly can so that it, it contributes to the innovation and, and the global economic value. I mean, so it, there's a balance and, and, and frankly, since we have been doing this for a while at the Internet Society, it has actually created a, uh, an awareness on both sides. You know, um, policymakers have, have um, started to acknowledge that they need to understand a little bit more about the, the, the Internet technical aspects and how things are built, much like the, the Internet engineers and, and technologists are now starting to become aware of, well, maybe I need to understand how to, to uh, look at things with the policymaker hat on, as well as to be able to express them in, in a means that, um, you know, the lang language resonates with, with a broader group than, than just the small collective that may be contributing to developing a, a technical solution. So I think that, it, you know, there again, that goes back to um, we're all really looking at what it means to be a multi-stakeholder and what's the appropriate uh, inclusiveness that we all need to consider as we move forward with this this concept and, and actually make it a true enabler for what we're trying to accomplish. Please. Let me give you perhaps an example because we're using public policy as if, you know, how to get government regulators and large think processes into your specific process, which is difficult. Um, but, you know, if, if you think of if industry before, 10 years ago, it was a very sequential design process concept. And I'm using industry, so it's someone in marketing or some business unit gets a brilliant idea. They then go speak to a technologist or enabler who can make the brilliant idea happen. Then someone remembers at some point, because you're going to sell this, you have to go speak to a lawyer. Uh, and the lawyer drafts a contract and may make a little minor change because it has to fit into the contract for legal purposes. And then you launch the product, and then someone remembers that maybe a policy guy should be spoken to somewhere along the way, and that's usually a month after the launch. Um, and then you end up adapting backwards. And adapting backwards means you start putting Band-Aids on things to fix problems that you weren't aware you had, whether it's because where, where you chose your data center for processing, what you did because you didn't secure this element, why are you collecting this element, maybe you shouldn't collect it. And then the, the Band-Aids go backwards, and over time, it's come to everyone's concept that this is not a cost-effective way of doing business. Because if you have a more collaborative team approach at the outset, it might take you a slightly bit longer time to move, but what happens is, if you get all those people in the room together and you discuss the project, it turns out the marketing guy has an idea. That idea is never correctly articulated to the technology guy anyway, so the technology guy has overdrafted his solution because he didn't understand what the request was and rather than have this guy come back to him 16 times for edits, he just gave him as much functionality as possible. But if you actually have everyone in the room together, the guy can actually articulate better what he needs because it's an iterative process. 
the technology guy can say, hey, you've got five different ways of doing this. The legal guy can tell you one of these is illegal. The policy guy can tell you two of these shouldn't happen. And then you're down to two processes that don't need Band-Aids, and you choose which is the best and most cost effective. And that's whether it's a privacy by design process, a security by design process. Those are the ways that you can actually be much more cost effective in the long run, even if it takes a little more effort at the beginning. So you know you might want to think about whether you have those elements policy with a small p as opposed to policy with a big p to help the design process. Thank you. Now the, the next question that that uh, was asked and oh we do. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Um, I wanted to follow on from what was said there. My name's Louise Bennett from the BCS um, because I think we have some good examples in Europe of when it's been done right and when it's been done wrong. Um, I think it's very important that policymakers produce simple, clear principles um, and then technologists can see if what they're producing actually meets the requirements of those principles. An example of where I think it was done right was uh, the European Commission's Data Protection Directive produced about 20 years ago where the eight principles for privacy of personal data still stand up well. Um, now they're going the wrong way in that they're trying to produce a data protection regulation which does all of the things that you said were wrong which will be mandatory and micromanages and produces things that are actually technologically impossible, like the right to be forgotten. Um, so I think uh, regulators need to produce clear principles about how things should be done. Technologists can then test whether the way they are developing their technology appears to them to meet those principles, and you can go forward uh, quite effectively. Um, I think I'd like to lead on from that to a question to the, to the panel, which I'm afraid does cover this area of cloud computing. Um, because of the European data protection laws, many countries think that this is simply um, used by European countries as a barrier to trade because they don't allow personal data to be held in cloud servers in other countries without breaking the laws in the EU. Um, and I think both sides have got it wrong because I think the requirement ought to be for any other country that is going to hold that data to demonstrate that they are meeting the principles that are required by EU countries. And that way you could have cross-border trade perfectly effectively, but I think it's become a, a real um, war that shouldn't be going on, and I'd like your opinion on that. Well, I, I, I think you I, I, I don't disagree with the first part of your statement. I think in the second part of your statement, you may have overstated the prohibition related to cloud. Under, under Directive 9546, especially under Article 26, which is the derogations, uh, you can actually do the transfers. You can accomplish them by model contracts. You can accomplish them in the case of consent. You can accomplish them in necessary to accomplish the purpose of the transaction. Uh, binding corporate rules have developed in relation to those that, that they weren't exactly clearly stated in the in the directive, but they have been they have emerged under the directive. So I, I think the directive does have and then there's also the formal adequacy finding by the commission in terms of data transfers. The problem is many of those solutions, and this is where the cloud dimension becomes problematic, many of those solutions operate well in a point-to-point -point environment but don't operate so well in a global multi-point environment because they become tremendously cumbersome to manage. So if you have to have a contract with everything and everybody who may touch the data, that's problematic because you're not exactly sure where the person is going to be touching the data from. You know, if the best person for, for fixing the problem your customer is having happens to be on vacation in a country that doesn't have an adequacy finding, you know, and, and the model contract didn't foresee that, then that person can't access the data, which means that person is not going to serve the customer, which might be the best person to serve the customer. So you have, it creates logistical issues. Um, and I think there are ways to think about how to work those. I actually think one of the most important ways, which is a principle that exists in the OECD privacy guidelines, 
it, it exists in the APEC privacy framework and it actually underpins the Canadian privacy law, which is PIPEDA, uh, is the concept of accountability. And that's the concept that obligation has to flow with the information. So that where the information goes, the protection has to be of the same quality and nature as where it left. But it doesn't rely on the law of the destination country. That can be an element, but that's not the only factor. You can use contracts and any number of other ways in which you can assure that level of protection. So in many ways, accountability is a more flexible approach to getting the same basis you're talking about. Uh, the Article 29 Working Group and the European Data Protection Supervisor have both written very interesting papers about a year and a half ago on accountability and how it could work. Um, the draft regulation picks up some of those concepts but doesn't really take them to a logical extreme in how they're implemented. Uh, and as you pointed out, the draft regulation has other shortcomings uh, of its own. The one problem the draft regulation did fix is while we may be in agreement on the principal level of the uh, regulation, the problem was the regulation was then implemented in a different fashion in each member state. So industry for a long time has asked for that problem to be addressed. That didn't mean industry was asking for a detailed regulation. What it meant was it was asking for a harmonized implementation of the principles of the directive so that you didn't have these one-off pieces in, in, in every member state. But I think both accountability is a possibility. The other thing which is a useful piece of information is there is a very interesting work going on between APEC. So in APEC, there's the concept of cross-border privacy rules, which is similar but not exactly the same as binding corporate rules in the European Union. For those who aren't familiar with either term, it's a concept that allows you to transfer information among a group of, uh, uh, um, in the European Union, the BCR is within a group of companies. Uh, cross-border privacy rules can be across a group of companies, but they are both kind of rules which you have to live up to, which you're vetted to, which are overseen, and which have enforcement bodies associated with them. What's currently happening is there's a mapping going on between the APEC cross-border rules and the European binding corporate rules. It's going on in APEC, but participating in that process is the CNIL, which is the French Data Prote Protection Authority, the ICO from the UK, uh, a representative from the German Data Protection Authority, a representative from the European Data Protection Supervisor, and a representative from the Commission. And what they're doing is they're doing a mapping to see how much of the requirements of a binding corporate rule are covered in a cross-border privacy rule. And the idea would be that if you can develop that mapping, and the guess is it's going to be about 75% commonality, then the question is, how do I not give you full mutual recognition because you're not doing everything, but how do I give you credit for the 75% you're doing so that you don't reinvent the wheel? And that's a concept of interoperability across regulation because we're not going to get to a harmonized regulatory format. But that concept secures that you're not dropping the level of protection in one country, but diminishes the administrative burdens required to demonstrate compliance. So that's a a little bit of innovation that I'll give two intergovernmental organizations credit for having pursued. Mike Nelson with Microsoft. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on OECD process. I think everybody here on this panel and most of us in the audience look at the OECD principles and say, yeah, those make a lot of sense. Where those principles are being violated, though, are when people who aren't going to the OECD make policy in their national governments. And whereas the OECD is primarily economics ministries, people interested in innovation and growth, a lot of policies come from law enforcement agencies or from people concerned about content. And in both cases, they come forward with policies that don't look like the internet um, policy making principles that you've outlined. Um, you have examples where countries are trying to clamp down on hate speech, or you have some draconian law enforcement measures that are going to go directly contrary to what you've outlined here. Is there a way or is there a need for the OECD to start marketing its principles to those 
agencies and is there a way to bring them into the process so that they feel that their concerns are are, are um, taken into account or are we just going to have this situation where different parts of the government have different priorities and they go off and do different things to the internet maybe I'll jump in first then um, there is an obvious tension there um, between these principles which we all agree are reasonable and the fact that they were developed by a relatively closed set of countries um, and so and a closed set of ministries yes yes um, so from my just talking for myself that's one of the reasons why I support um, the IGF having a role in developing a more global meet a set of principles and indeed in the other session next door to us that's what they're discussing right now um, and so I think that that would have a lot of value it can draw from the OECD principles it can draw from the Brazilian principles it can draw from other sets of principles we can find commonalities there and then we can develop something that has a um, broader ownership and which isn't seen as being a top-down north to south um, instrument Maybe I would <clears throat> bring a different uh, um, dimension, but, but complementary dimension. Um, what about those countries who don't yet have a um, privacy directive that's clearly, clearly uh, outlined and uh, abided, abided to? I think it's, it's quite, quite desirable to bring those countries into the picture early on before problems are being faced. Talking about uh, countries emerging economies, the, um, what are referred to as, as South, instead of having North to South directive, I think Inclusive, inclusive interaction is, is more valuable and um, trying to raise the awareness early on before the problems are, are being faced. Some of the countries, as was mentioned, have the issues of, of um, security agencies cracking down on, on, on um, the freedom of expression, uh, being online or offline. So this kind of inclusion early on I think would be quite, quite valuable and perhaps it puts a burden more on, on the developed, developed world, on, on the north to bring bring on the um, other uh, other um, um, countries into the policy making forces. I, I guess I would want to remind people that the 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 OECD also has observers that are not just delegations from civil society, from technical society, business, and, and trade union. They also have observer countries. There was also a significant outreach at the high level leaders meeting related to the policy making principles that actually brought a number of other countries into the mix. It allowed them to have a comment period related to those and they had, a number of them became signatories to this document. So this isn't a pure North telling the South, this isn't a pure we aren't thinking about you. Uh, the, the, we have for the longest time suggested to the OECD that they need to take the documents that are created and develop an outreach process related to them to actually figure out how to make those documents more applicable and relevant to the countries that weren't as involved in their development because their development is not necessarily uniquely tailored to countries but it's actually applicable beyond those countries but you actually then have to go out and make that document more relevant to countries directly so this is this is something that we have continued to suggest as a positive and valuable addition to the OECD and I, I think there is no there is no uh, limitation that the OECD would see on doing that except for budget uh, because it actually costs money to be able to go out and kind of take the document on the road and move those things and I think there, every every organization is seeing budget constraints and in, in tight economies so I think uh, there is an issue related to budget and what they can do with that the other thing I would say is you know I, I'm not sure that another set of principles actually answers the problem and I don't think the other set of principles would address the problem that you made about which ministry is playing and which ministry is paying attention uh, I think you know one of the things that the OECD process does do and some countries do it better than others is there are interagency processes within governments where they consult broadly across the agencies in terms of vetting the language and vetting the position now whether that means that they're going to pay attention to it once the document is done is a very different concept but at least there's a feeling that they had input at the time it was developed you know you, you can take that for what it's worth but I, I don't think you can we don't live in a perfect world where you can fix the problem and everyone is bound to to what they discussed I think uh, I think the policy making principles aren't perfect but they're a significant improvement and a beneficial benchmark that goes out there that helps countries think about this and you know in in the developing country context 
they're going to take principles and things they see in other places and figure out how to adapt them to what are needs in their economies. Uh, and you know, one of the things, I'll go back to the, the APEC document of the Digital Prosperity Checklist, which was a useful exercise, was we, we took a set of principles related to digital prosperity uh, under a number of different headings. But then we also created a document that discussed what's the benefits of getting this right. Why does the economy gain from doing this correctly? That's one of the things that's also missing from the policy documents is the explanation of why this is useful to you at every level of development. And that would also be a useful thing to make policy more applicable across a broader range of, of economies. We're, we're about out of time, so I would like to ask the panelists if they had any closing remarks um, before we end our session or if there's any additional questions from the participants. Well, I would like to thank our panelists for, for their contribution and the dialogue that we've had today, and very much would like to thank you for participating in this discussion. I think we've, we've had a very good um, exchange on the value of openness, some considerations and, 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 and approaches to collaboration, as well as inclusiveness in, in that dialogue and how we might want to approach getting more um, governments, individuals, technologists involved in the dialogue and that maybe through the uh, IEGF and similar processes we can continue this collaboration in, in hopes of enabling more innovation, um, more economic advantages for developing countries. Um, and the ability to, to share even more in, in things that, that have yet to be uh, invented or understood, but, but in come up with a, a means of collaborating. So I'd like to thank the panelists. I would like to thank you very much for, for participating and um, like to conclude the workshop.